This audio program is presented by audible.com. Audible, audio that speaks to you wherever you are. From Simon and Schuster Audio. Golf is a game of confidence. By Dr. Bob Rotella with Bob Cullen. Read by Dr. Bob Rotella. Golfers sometimes ask me for my definition of confidence. I've been fortunate enough to spend more than 20 years working with athletes as a head coach, a trainer of the mind. For about a dozen of those years, I've been teaching and coaching professional golfers. Here is one of the best definitions I've come up with Confidence is playing with your eyes. The eye of the confident athlete zeroes in on the objective. The brain and the rest of the body simply react. The basketball shooter doesn't give herself a lecture on the mechanics of pushing a ball through the air. The pitcher doesn't mentally rehearse the motions of the shoulder, arm, elbow, wrist, and finger that produce a slider. The trap shooter needn't ponder how to coordinate the movements of his torso and his trigger finger. Confident athletes let their brains and nervous systems perform the skills they have rehearsed and mastered without interference from the conscious mind. So it should be with the golfer. The confident golfer sees where he wants the ball to go. Sometimes, even after he turns his eyes back to the ball, he continues to see the target with his mind's eye. He lets his body swing the club. The more confident he is, the better the chance the ball will go there. Most golfers experience confidence only occasionally and only haphazardly. They normally play in a state of barely repressed tension. Their swings and scores reflect it. But now and again, for reasons they do not understand, things fall into place. They hit a couple of good shots, sink a putt or two, and suddenly they feel confident. They begin playing with their eyes, hitting the ball to the target, and they experience golf on an entirely different level. They string pars and birdies together. They glimpse their potential as golfers. I teach all golfers that they are endowed with free will. They can control their thoughts. In fact, they are responsible for their thoughts. They can choose to think confidently. They can take this confidence with them every time they go to the golf course. And they can have it from their first swing to their last. But it takes an honest commitment to develop confidence. I have found that simply stating this premise does not persuade a lot of people. They are not accustomed to thinking the way great golfers think. They can't believe confidence is something they can control and learn. I've found that stories teach more effectively than lectures on theory. So I've assembled some stories about players I have known and worked with. These golfers have two things in common. They love the game, and they all have something to teach you about confidence, about playing with your eyes. Brad Faxon had to learn how to stay in the present and play one shot at a time if he was going to be the best player he could be. The first hole at the Riviera Country Club in Los Angeles presents a lot of choices. It's a great starting hole, a 501-yard par 5. The tee sits 80 feet above the fairway, giving the player a panoramic view of the Verdant Canyon where the course is situated. For the members, this elevation provides the comfort and assurance that the first shot will at least get up in the air. And it means that even if their first couple of strokes are hit with irons or fairway woods, are the product of stiff muscles, and don't go particularly far, they still have a chance to reach the green in regulation and get started with a par. But to Brad Faxon, standing on that elevated tee at the beginning of the last round of the 1995 PGA Championship, Number one looked much more challenging. It was the last opportunity to earn points for the Ryder Cup team, and Brad had been dreaming of playing in the Ryder Cup for a long time. To earn enough points to make the team, Brad had to play not just an excellent round, but a superb one, a round that would vault him past at least a dozen players and into the top five. He faced, in short, one of the great challenges of the game. Could he produce his best golf 
when he most wanted to produce it. Brad and the thousands of spectators in the canyon below knew that if he were to make the Ryder Cup team, he could hardly afford to start with a comfortable par on hole number one. He wanted to birdie the hole, to eagle it if possible. Doing that would require a long, accurate drive off the tee. Fortunately, Brad had been preparing to hit that drive for a long time. When I first started working with him in the late 1980s, he was a young player with a deaf short game and an extraordinary mind. Brad is one of the most enthusiastic, optimistic, and playful human beings I have ever encountered. He loves playing games of all kinds, and he is very creative. But he lacked confidence in his driver. When he mishit a wedge or a putt, as even the best players do, he had no trouble forgetting it and believing that the next shot would go in. But when he sprayed a drive off the tee, he felt as if all the energy had been sucked out of his body. Thereafter, the club felt suspect in his hands. We worked for several years on this problem. To begin with, Brad hit a lot of three woods off tees where his fellow competitors hit drivers, sacrificing distance for the sake of confidence. He worked with a swing instructor to fix some minor flaws in his mechanics. He worked at developing the discipline to savor and remember his good drives and the patience to wait as his driving improved. Gradually, he became more confident, and in 1992, he broke through to win twice and finish eighth on the money list. He still was, and probably always will be, most confident with a wedge or putter in his hands. Even the best players find that certain facets of the game come easily to them. They must work at trusting others. But Brad had begun to relish hitting his driver again. Brad chose to dwell on thoughts that would help him. He had not played particularly well in the weeks preceding the tournament. Nevertheless, as he headed to California, Brad thought he was playing well. He simply wasn't pulling his game together and scoring. Fortunately, he's always liked Riviera. It's a course whose holes are visible. There are no blind shots. The Riviera greens were still soft from a partially successful reconstruction job during the previous year. Brad knew that they were bound to spike up and that lots of players would gripe about it. He decided to think of that as an advantage. If he could will himself to take the greens as he found them, without complaint, he would have a huge advantage over all the players who would whine, moan, and convince themselves that the conditions of the greens meant that they weren't going to make any putts. As we often do, Brad and I took a walk together on the eve of the tournament's final round. This time it was a short walk, up a staircase at the home of a friend, Peter Lomenzo, to a little deck with a bench and a view of the Pacific. We sat and talked. He knows by now that there are no magic words, no parlor tricks that a sports psychologist can perform to put a player into the right frame of mind before a crucial round. He knows that there are no startling new breakthroughs in behavioral science that I can reveal to him to help him play better. He knows and even enjoys the fact that our conversation will revolve around two basic and interrelated ideas that we have discussed many times before. One is staying in the present. The second is committing to the process. A large part of this program will be devoted to elaborating on these two ideas. To play golf as well as he can, a player has to focus his mind tightly on the shot he is playing now in the present. A player can't think about what happened to the last shot he hit or the shot he played with the tournament on the line a week ago. That's thinking about the past. He can't think about how great it would be to win the tournament or how terrible it would be to blow it. That's thinking about the future. I told Brad that Saturday evening that he was doing everything right with his mind. He just had to be patient and trust that the results would come. I told him that his goal ought to be simple, to be able to stand in front of the mirror on Sunday night with a big grin on his face, able to tell himself that he had trusted his swing all day, that he had had fun playing a meaningful round of golf. Standing on the first tee, Brad told me later, he immersed his mind in the process of hitting good shots. Good players typically have a physical routine wrapped around this mental process to make sure the alignment and posture are consistently correct. 
Physical routines can vary. Brad, for example, sometimes takes a practice swing and sometimes doesn't. But the mental routine at the heart of the process cannot vary. Brad went through this process again and swung. The drive was flawless, exactly as Brad had envisioned it. So was the second, a shot that started high, drew into the pin, and cleared the bunker with a few yards to spare. It rolled to a stop about 15 feet past the hole. Now he faced an eagle putt. If there was one thing Brad had found fault with in his play for the first few days, it was his putting. He had not, he felt, been free enough. When Brad is putting well, he comes close to having the ideal mind. He never thinks about speed. He feels that thinking about speed is like thinking about how far to throw a ball when you're playing catch. The outcome is likely to be an awkward toss. In the same way, thoughts like don't run it too far past or get it there lead to lots of three putts. Once he's over a putt, Brad doesn't think specifically about getting the ball in the hole. He's already picked out a line that he's convinced will do that. He concentrates narrowly on the task at hand, getting the ball rolling well on the line he has selected. Then he waits to see what happens, letting the green take care of everything else. He knows that when his mind is right, his system and his senses will take care of touch and direction much better than he would if he tried consciously to control those variables. On the first hole at Riviera, Brad's eagle putt went right in the hole. He was on his way, and he was brimming with confidence. To be sure, success breeds confidence. But great players don't depend on success at the first green for their confidence. They strive to maintain the same attitude whether or not the first putt falls. Still, it was great to nail that first putt. Number two at Riviera is the toughest hole on the course, a 460-yard par four that calls for a long fade off the tee and a long iron second shot to a narrow green. Again, Brad shaped his shots just as he envisioned them, but this time his 22-foot birdie putt ran just past the edge. At the third, Brad again drove into the fairway. Without too much thought, he asked for a six iron. Brad was playing by feel, trusting his instincts. He knows that being trusting and decisive have more to do with the success of a shot than perfectly calibrating the distance. Brad's six iron went dead straight and stopped five feet from the hole. Lining up that putt for the first time that day, he let his mind wander from the present. He thought for a moment that if he made the putt, he would be three under after just three holes off to a brilliant start. Players with great minds don't stay in the present on every shot. They only strive to. The good ones monitor themselves and catch themselves when their minds start to wander. This is what Brad did. He reminded himself to get back into his putting process. He used a physical cue, lining up the Torbalata line on his Titleist with the line on which he intended to roll the putt, and he knocked it in. He parred the fourth, a 230-yard par three. At the fifth tee, he pulled out his three-wood to play a 419-yard par four. He hooked his tee shot at number five into the first cut of the rough, but the three-wood did its job, leaving him short of more serious trouble and able to play a seven-iron into the green, which he did, leaving himself a 30-foot putt. Brad had not been making many 30-footers during the tournament, but as he lined this one up, he was thinking he was due to make one. He got the ball rolling on his intended line, and at the last moment, it dove left into the hole. He was four under for the day. Number six is Riviera's signature hole, a 175-yard par three with a little pot bunker in the middle of the green. In practice, this means that the hole has alternate greens, one to the left of the bunker and one to the right. The pin on this day was back left. Brad could immediately see the perfect shot, a six iron, starting at the left edge of the pot bunker and drawing in toward the flag. He hit it and left himself a 15-foot putt with a right-to-left break. 
The cup, he could see, was cut into a slope, and the green looked shaggier to him. He sensed that this putt would be a little slower than the previous ones. Again, he hit it perfectly, and again it went in. That birdie brought some new potential distractions. The crowd roared, and he could see that his gallery was beginning to swell. He glanced at a leaderboard and saw that his name was on it. He had jumped from five under to ten under, and he had moved up into the middle of the top ten. As the Riviera crowd roared, Brad could feel his body responding, starting to feel more nervous and excited. At the same time, he felt acutely sensitive to everything around him. He hit a three-wood off the tee at number seven, a 408-yard par four, and left himself 151 yards to the pin. The wind was at his back, and he felt strong. He hit a nine-iron. So sharp was his feel for the ball that while it was in the air, he thought it might be a bit short, and he said go to it. It landed three feet short of the hole. The putt had a six-inch break. Brad knew better than to linger over it, to think too much, and to get careful. He stroked it in. Now the crowd was big and loud, and his friends in the gallery were screaming. He could see people who had been watching other pairings streaming toward the eighth tee. He felt buoyed by the noise and excitement. Brad, again following his game plan, pulled out a three-wood. Number eight is a tight 370-yard par four with overhanging trees blocking approaches from the right edge of the fairway. Brad played down the left side, but he hit the ball a little too hard. He was in the rough with a decent lie, but not much chance to spin his approach. His wedge flew up from the rough, wobbled a little in the air, and bounced once in the rough before rolling onto the green and stopping eight feet from the hole. The crowd roared, thinking that Brad had planned it that way. Now distractions were assaulting Brad's mind. He thought that making the putt would move him to seven under for the day, and perhaps into the tournament's top five. Not coincidentally, for the first time that day, he overread a putt. He played a break that wasn't there, and the ball slid by the hole. He walked to the ninth tee. Spectators clapped him on the back, told him how well he was doing. The breeze was again at his back, and he aimed his drive at the pair of bunkers that guard the fairway. His ball carried about 280 yards, well over both bunkers, and left him between a 9-iron and a wedge to the green. He hit the 9-iron about 25 feet past the hole. He had another birdie putt, and now he could not ignore the physical symptoms of nerves. His fingers and hands were tingling. The yelling of the crowd rang in his ears. I teach players to welcome these nervous symptoms rather than fear them. They work in practice all their lives to make it to a situation like the one Brad was in, a situation that gets the adrenaline flowing. They have to remember that lots of tournaments have been won by players in that condition. Brad welcomed his symptoms and rolled the birdie putt. It seemed to have missed, but it was breaking so sharply at the end that it half turned around and fell in at the top of the hole. The crowd, in this situation in a major championship, becomes part of the action. It emitted a roar unlike any Brad had ever heard for himself. He jabbed at the sky with his fist. He got goosebumps. His heart started to pound. He had gone out in 28 strokes. It was the lowest nine-hole total ever in a major championship. Brad worked hard not to get carried away by the excitement. At number 10, a 315-yard par 4. He opted for a 3-iron off the tee because the wind was not helping him, although he knew that some of the big hitters would try to drive the green. His sand wedge second from 80 yards out in the fairway was 10 feet short of the hole, and he missed his birdie putt. At number 11, the wind was behind him, and he decided to try to reach the green 564 yards away in two shots. His drive was perfect finding the narrow landing area about 285 yards out. He crushed a three-wood that carried 245 yards and bounced up to the green. The eagle putt stayed out this time, but the birdie pulled him to eight under for the day and 13 under for the tournament. Now his thoughts did edge ahead of himself. 
After two strong shots at number 12, he had an eight-foot birdie putt. But he pulled the birdie putt, missing by four inches. The crowd gasped as if the putt had just missed, but Brad knew he had hit it badly. Four inches on an eight-foot putt is a canyon-sized miss for a player of his caliber. Then he did the only thing he could do in the circumstances. He quietly laughed at himself for allowing all the extraneous influences to affect him. And he began working to draw his attention back to where it had to be. He did a good job parring numbers 13 and 14. And now there were two conflicting thoughts running through his mind. Don't, he told himself, let a couple of Miss Birdie putts discourage you. Stay with the process. Stay in the present. But at the same time, he was thinking they had only four holes left. He needed some birdies to make a run at the championship. Number 15 is one of the toughest holes on the back side, a 447-yard dogleg right. Still feeling powerful, Brad blew his drive right over the fairway bunker that marks the dogleg's turn. He pushed any thought of a hook out of his mind and decided instead to hit what he calls a punch-and-hold fade into the breeze. It went where his mind had envisioned it, leaving him a 15-foot birdie putt. His putting stroke faltered here, and he hit the putt too hard. It was the first putt of the day he could recall that felt wrong leaving the putter. But his mental mistake came on the second putt, a three-footer downhill with a small break to the right. He had a clump of spike marks between his ball and the hole, and he thought about the spike marks instead of trusting his stroke. He missed and made bogey. Now Brad faced yet another challenge to his mental discipline. When a player in the midst of a hot round hits a bad shot or two and makes a bogey or worse, all sorts of useless thoughts are liable to flit through his mind. There goes 59, or there goes the Ryder Cup, or how could I have missed that putt? All of those are thoughts focused on the past. The only useful thought for Brad to entertain at that moment was about where he wanted to hit his tee shot on number 16, which is exactly what Brad did. Number 16 is an old-fashioned kind of island green par 3, the kind virtually surrounded by sand. Brad hit a 7-iron with a draw that checked up about 25 feet short of the hole. He willed himself to concentrate on his putting process. The ball broke hard left to right and dove in. He pumped his fist again, and moved through the roars to the tee at number 17. He was again eight under par for the day, and he wanted another birdie. But number 17 is a long par five, 578 yards, unreachable for Brad. That did not undermine his belief that he could make a birdie. All he wanted to do was lay up to give himself a good wedge shot to the green, then trust his putter. He hit a fine wedge but it caught the slope leading to the upper tier of the green where the pin was. A foot or two farther, and it might have been knocked stiff, but it rolled backwards down the slope and left him 30 feet away. That did not bother him. He believed that he could make the next putt, and he hit it beautifully. It stayed right on the edge of the hole. He could not believe it didn't fall. Days later, looking at the videotape, he still couldn't. Standing on the tee at 18, he knew that whatever slim chance he had to win the tournament was probably gone. He had no idea where he stood for the Ryder Cup team. He got under his drive for the first time that day, popped it up, and left himself 20 or 30 yards short of his accustomed spot on the 18th fairway. He tried to hit the same kind of hard five iron he hit at number one. He didn't catch it as well, and he wound up about five yards short of the green, looking at an uphill chip. The 18th green at Riviera is in the middle of a natural grass amphitheater, and by now it was filled with people. There was an enormous scoreboard on the hillside, and Brad looked at it. He saw he was in fourth place. He still didn't know exactly what he needed to do to make the Ryder Cup team, but he knew it was enormously important to finish his round by remaining focused until his ball was in the hole. He hit his chip a touch too hard. It rolled over the dry, crusty back half of the green and didn't stop until it was 12 feet past. 
Brad thereupon forgot about the Ryder Cup in the standings. He thought only of making his 12-footer. He read the green from both sides of the hole and noticed that there were three or four spike marks in his line, about two feet short of the hole. He told himself that there was nothing he could do about them. He told himself to start the ball in its line and trust that it would hold that line as it got to the hole. It did. The roar of the crowd reverberated around the amphitheater. It was the loudest sound Brad had ever heard on a golf course. Brad had closed with a 63, the lowest final round score ever in a PGA championship. No one has ever shot a better score in a major championship. He made his way to the scorer's tent through a throng of screaming people and signed his scorecard. Someone from CBS invited him to climb up to the announcer's booth and talk about his round. And it was only there that he learned from the CBS producers that the Ryder Cup team was within his grasp. A few minutes later, Davis Love III and Fred Couples called the locker room to let Brad know he had made it. That was typical of the way so many golfers, though remaining competitors, find ways to support and encourage their friends on the tour. If you've gotten the impression that a great round of golf is comprised of dozens of skirmishes in the mind of the golfer, not all of which are won, you're right. I have recounted this round in detail because it illustrates that even the best players, playing as well as anyone has ever played, wage constant war with doubts and fears and distractions. Some weeks it's easier than others, but if they don't conquer the doubts on a particular shot, the best players pick themselves up and gather themselves to work on the next one. That's what Brad did in the final round of the PGA. He wasn't perfect. He was merely striving for perfection. He disciplined his mind to give himself the best chance he could to play as well as he could. And he saw just how good that could be. Next is a story about how Pat Bradley finished her victory lap. The most intense athlete with whom I have ever worked might not draw a second glance walking through the average shopping mall. Our media stereotype of the intense, mentally tough athlete is a masculine one, maybe a linebacker, shot full of painkillers, laying waste to quarterbacks on Sunday afternoon. Not many sports writers associate intensity and toughness with the image of a slightly built woman, prematurely gray, with a shy, unassuming demeanor. But mental toughness has no gender. Pat Bradley is slightly built, shy, and unassuming. But Pat has an intensity that can sear you when she chooses to reveal it. She is as mentally tough as any human being I have ever known. When Pat first came to see me, she had been a fixture on the LPGA Tour for about 10 years. She had already won a number of tournaments, including the U.S. Women's Open. But what she had to say about herself excited and impressed me. She didn't want to talk about the tournament she'd won. She wanted to talk about the time she'd finished second. She wanted to know how she could convert those second-place finishes into first. She understood that no matter how good a player is, she faces two choices. She can get better, or she can stagnate. And Pat wanted to get better. Because she had great dreams and huge ambitions, she wanted to win more tournaments, especially major championships. She wanted to be Player of the Year. She wanted to be in the LPGA Hall of Fame. I love to work with athletes who dream. What impressed me most was why Pat thought she could do such things. She had never been a prodigy, one of the USGA's golden girls. She grew up in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, the daughter of a man who owned a ski and sports shop. Golf seasons are relatively short in New England, and as a junior player, she didn't rank with her peers from California and the South, who got to play all year round. She was, she likes to say, a local yokel. It wasn't until she was halfway through college at Florida International that she thought her game might be good enough for the LPGA. Even then, she didn't have any flashy physical talent to set her apart. 
She drives the ball about 230 yards, which was average for the LPGA. She didn't have the silken roll that marks a great natural putter like Ben Crenshaw or Nancy Lopez. What Pat did have was an appreciation for the power of her own mind. She felt she was capable of seeing every shot before she hit it, of willing herself to get the ball in the hole. And that kind of resolve can more than make up for a little bit less than optimal length off the tee. Pat had already figured out most of what I teach golfers about the mental game. It was a challenge to me to find ways to help her get even better. She mentioned that when she got into position to win, she started to feel the physical symptoms of nerves. She got butterflies, and she feared that. I told her to embrace the butterflies. They signified that she was where she was supposed to be. She had worked hard to be good enough to get into contention. The onset of nerves only verified that her hard work was paying off. Pat liked that idea, and she used it to help herself get comfortable either in the lead or challenging for it. She liked another idea I mentioned to her. I told her that our bodies and brains are, in one sense at least, like computers. The data that a computer receives will inevitably be reflected in the data it puts out. This reinforced her ability to see her shots before she hit them. She believed that she could win because she had the strongest mind, the best ability to visualize successful shots. She gave her mind only positive input. And then she went on a tear. In 1986, she won the Dinah Shore, the LPGA, and the Demaria Classic. She lost the U.S. Women's Open by a few strokes. It was the closest any LPGA player has ever come to the Grand Slam. She fulfilled her dream of being Player of the Year. Then she did it again in 1991. Pat, in those years, played with her eyes. No matter where she hit the ball, she thought calmly and confidently about getting the next shot where she wanted it to go. She rolled in putts from all over the green. She made par from the woods, from water, from sand. It didn't matter. She saw herself as Houdini, able to escape from anything. No matter how many shots she fell behind, she believed she would come back. And with that attitude, she often could. At one 1986 tournament, with an elite field of 16 players, she started the final round almost in last place, seven strokes off the lead. She shot 63 on Sunday and won. She had a lot in common with Ben Hogan. Neither one was a great player at the onset. They needed a long time to get to the top. Like Hogan's, Pat's discipline was so intense that she had no attention to spare for small talk. She had a reputation as a grim player and a silent one. Of course, that was a distorted perspective. As Pat once told me, from the time I teed off to the time I finished, I was always talking. I was in constant, silent communication with myself. It was just that people couldn't hear it, couldn't share it. At times in those years, I worried about how hard Pat drove herself. She couldn't leave the game at the golf course. As soon as one round was over, she started thinking about the next one, planning every shot on every hole. More often than not, she ate dinner by herself in a her room. For company, she might have an occasional Red Sox or Celtics game on television. As Pat herself will tell you, away from the golf course, she sometimes had an intense fear of failure. She worried that if she played badly, she would be letting people down, her father, the rest of her family, even her fans. It didn't matter that the truth was that her family and friends would have felt the same about her no matter how she played. No matter how much she achieved, she was unrelentingly self-critical. If she shot 68, she was all right. If she shot 75, she was a bum in her own mind. I told her that she should be patting herself on the back more often for the great things that she'd accomplished. But Pat found that very hard to do. There was no denying that her intensity was helping her win golf tournaments, and she very much wanted to win golf tournaments. In 1987, she fell ill with Graves' disease, but she continued to whip herself to perform. Graves' disease is an illness of the thyroid gland. In Pat, it manifested itself in shaky hands, body tremors, and general weakness. On the course, she had to change her position at address because she was afraid her shaky hands might inadvertently 
caused the club to move the ball. She turned away from other competitors when she took a drink of water, for fear they would see the liquid sloshing in the cup. At airports, she could barely make it up the first step into a rental car courtesy van. But she confided in no one, fearful of showing weakness. For nearly a year, she told herself that she just needed a rest, that she was trying too hard, or even that she was creating the symptoms psychosomatically. Finally, on a layover in Dallas in early 1988, she called a friend, Dr. Skip Garvey. He listened to her describe her symptoms for about five minutes. He ordered immediate blood tests. The next day, when he told her she was physically sick, Pat felt as happy as if she'd just won a golf tournament. At least there was something really wrong with her. At least she had not failed. It was just her body, and there was a cure. Her illness demonstrated that no matter how mentally tough an athlete might be, calamity can still befall her. Toughness is not invulnerability, but toughness can help to overcome calamity. It did with Pat. She took radiation treatment and started on a medication regimen. Gradually, she and her doctors brought the disease under control. By 1989, she started to win again. Her ultimate goal, clearly in view, the LPGA Hall of Fame. The LPGA Hall of Fame is the most exclusive shrine in sports. No one is elected. To make it in, a player has to win 30 LPGA tournaments, including two majors. By way of comparison, if the same standard were in use for the men's tour, only one currently active player, Tom Watson, could have enough wins to qualify. No one else would be close. In 1991, Pat went on another tear, winning five tournaments and Player of the Year honors again. In the autumn of that year, she won tournaments back-to-back -back for her 29th and 30th victories. The penultimate victory, the Safeco Classic, was an archetypical Bradley triumph. She birdied the 72nd hole to tie Rosie Jones at 280. They went back to the tee at number 18, a par 5 for the playoff. Pat sliced her drive into a creek. She dropped, hit a wood, then a full 9-iron fourth, and sank an 18-foot par putt to keep the playoff going. She birdied the next hole to win. She really was like Houdini. When she won the next week, she was in. She had nothing left to prove. And as soon as that happened, she stopped winning. I was exhausted, Pat has told me. The mental effort that enabled her to win golf tournaments, the ascetic discipline, had taken a lot out of her. Making it into the Hall of Fame enabled her to tell herself she could rest. She looked around and decided that there were other things in her life that she wanted to pay attention to. Her relationship with her fellow competitors had always been respectful, but generally distant. She started cultivating friendships, going out to dinner. She chatted a little on the golf course. She even enjoyed the faint look of shock on the other players' faces when she talked and smiled during a round. The slight change in her personality, however, affected her golf. Putts she would have made in 1986 and 1991 lipped out in 92 and 93. Her confidence in her ability to get the ball in the hole wavered. Without that bright, flaming intensity, her physical skills were just average. For three seasons, she was winless, and she finished no higher than 19th on the money list. I told her not to worry. She was taking the psychological equivalent of a victory lap. It's only natural that a person's desires change as her life progresses. When it was over, when she'd smell the flowers long enough, she would know what to do to get back to winning. A couple of years after her Hall of Fame ceremony, Pat called me up. She had decided her victory lap was over. This has been fun, Bob, she said, but I don't want to drop off the earth. I don't care if I win all the time, but I want to be one of the top ten players again. So we started talking about ways to balance an intense approach to golf with being the sunnier, friendlier golfing personality she had become since 1991. We started talking about ways she could still win, but without exhausting and isolating herself. If she could adapt, we decided, she could have it both ways. Step one was a slightly curtailed schedule. During her best years, Pat played a lot of tournaments. Typically, She'd go on tour for six weeks in a row, and she felt she usually reached her peak in the last three weeks of that stretch. 
We discussed playing no more than three consecutive weeks without a rest. The trick, I said, was to forget about using the first tournament or two to warm up. She had to be at her best from the first day of the first tournament. We talked about learning to leave the game at the golf course. I encouraged her to keep developing friendships to help younger players, to share what she'd learned. She would be giving something back to the game by doing so. She'd also be helping herself. She could still take a limited time each evening to think about the next day's round, visualizing her shots. On the course, I felt she needn't spend the whole day in an isolation chamber. She could continue to talk to her fellow competitors and to the galleries and still play well if she could learn to modify her pre-shot routine. She needed to insert a step in the routine that consisted of shutting out all the outside distractions and getting into her old, intense mode of thinking. She had to learn to turn it on and off. This is an important lesson for anyone who hopes to play competitive golf and maintain a family and a social life. A golfer has to learn to compartmentalize. The happiest players are the ones who do so. Over the last year or so, Pat has worked hard on finding this balance in her life. It is starting to pay off. She started last season with her game in great shape after a winter of practice. She had taken to heart my advice that if she was going to play a curtailed schedule, she had to be ready to play whenever she teed it up. She could not afford, as some players do, to play her way into competitive shape. On the practice range before that first round of the season, at the Chrysler Plymouth Tournament of Champions at the Grand Cypress Course in Orlando, Pat was hitting the ball beautifully. She was thinking, Sound the bell. I'm ready. She was cocky. And she shot 79. That night, she shed tears of frustration. Then she rallied. Pat, there are three more days, she told herself. You can bounce back. You've done it before. For the next three days, she used the pain of that 79 to goad herself, and she played excellent golf. She finished the tournament tied for third. The players stayed in Orlando for the next tournament, the Health South inaugural at Disney World's Eagle Pines course. Pat opened with a 71 and a 72, but the course was playing very tough in cold, windy weather. She was only two shots off the lead held by Beth Daniel. Entering the final round of the 54-hole event, she felt relaxed and free of pressure. After three winless years, she thought, no one expected her to overtake Daniel. Only Pat knew how close she was to regaining the form she had in 1986 and 1991. She struck the ball beautifully on the front nine, hitting every fairway and every green. But the greens on the course were chewed up Bermuda grass, and she made only one birdie putt, although she had several of about four feet and half a dozen inside 15 feet. But Pat stayed patient. It seems almost contradictory, but during her intense winning years, she was always able to stay patient. During her victory lap years, when her intensity wasn't as good, she had less patience. She found herself slamming the putter back into the bag when she was unhappy with her performance on the greens. In fact, there is no contradiction. When she was at her most intense, Pat was also her most confident. A confident player shrugs off a missed birdie putt and figures that the miss only improves the odds that the next one will go in. That was how Pat felt that Sunday afternoon in Florida. She birdied numbers 11 and 12 to take the lead at four under. But Daniel, playing behind her, regrouped with birdies of her own at numbers 14 and 15. She drew even. Pat hit a perfect drive on number 17, a nasty par four with a large, shallow green that sloped from front to back, fronted on the left by a lake and on the right by a bunker. Her second shot would have to be just as good, long enough to clear the lip of the bunker, but not so long as to roll down the slope and off the back of the green. The wind was behind her, making it even harder. Pat went through her routine, visualized the shot she wanted, and hit what she later described as a career six iron, pure as the driven snow. It landed softly on the green and stopped 15 feet past the hole. She had an uphill right-to-left putt, and she hit it aggressively. It was her margin of victory. She was back. Pat went on to do almost exactly as she had told me she hoped she would in 1995. 
She limited her stints on the road to three or four weeks. She finished 11th on the money list. She was in the top 10 nearly a dozen times. She made a run at the U.S. Open, and she kept her life in balance. Now, in her mid-40s, she's taken up weight training during the week she's not on the circuit. She tells me she feels stronger than she did when she started as a professional. I think the autumn of her career may turn out to be an Indian summer. The next story is about how Davis Love III got back to the Masters. Davis Love Jr. had two of the softest hands I have ever seen in a golfer, and a temperament to match. I met Davis when we were both on the staff at Golf Digest Schools. He was the first person I ever saw who looked like his hands got softer through impact when he hit a golf ball. After I got to know him, I started calling him the King of Smooth. I liked him very much. Shortly after we got to know one another, he invited me to his home. He wanted to show me some of the volumes in his library of golf books, the ones that showed how some of the great players of the past had approached the mental game. But the first thing that caught my eye was an old yellowed newspaper clipping, framed and hanging on the wall. It told how a teenager named Davis Love Jr. had made it to the quarterfinals or semifinals of the U.S. Amateur. The reporter had observed that this qualified him for an invitation to play in the Masters and asked if he planned to go. I don't know, Davis replied. Where are they playing it this year? As we got to know one another, I heard more and more about his two sons, Mark and Davis III. Teaching them had been his first priority since they were old enough to hold clubs. I heard stories about twilight rounds of golf. Davis would come home tired from a long day on the lesson tee, and the boys would greet him at the door. Come on, Dad, let's go golfing. So off he'd go, walking on his tired legs, because the boys wanted to walk. They'd play four holes, and the boys would want a soda, so into the clubhouse they'd trudge. Davis might suggest that they resume on the first hole again, but the boys would have none of it, so he'd walk back out to the fifth hole with them and finish from there. Not surprisingly, they grew up loving the game. But it was Davis III who had the yen to become a professional, and as the years passed, the game got more serious for both father and son. Davis Jr. taught his namesake a long, fluid swing of enormous power. And through long hours of drilling in the hot Georgia sun, Davis III developed into a golfer with the potential for greatness. Davis III had the requisite mechanical skills with the wedge and putter. Davis Jr. had seen to that but he didn't have a consistent routine. Sometimes he would look at the hole, bring his eyes back to the ball, and tense up, thinking about the mechanics of his stroke. That became clear when I asked him to talk out loud about what he was doing as he prepared to putt or chip. Davis was a big basketball fan and a friend of Michael Jordan, who had attended the University of North Carolina at about the same time. So we talked about the way a good basketball player's head operates. He could see that Jordan didn't stop in the middle of a move to the basket to think carefully about mechanics. Jordan locked his eyes on the rim and let the ball go. I wanted Davis to react to his targets in the same way. To help break his old habits, I asked him to try a new putting routine. At its core, any good routine has three elements, a last look at the target, bringing the eyes back to the ball, and the start of the swing. They should be performed rhythmically, and sequentially, so there is no significant delay between bringing the eyes back to the ball and beginning the swing. I want the brain and nervous system reacting to that last look at the target, so I suggested that Davis start taking the putter back as he brought his eyes to the ball. Davis understood the concept, and he adopted the new routine. The new problem was that he was hitting too many putts six feet past the hole. He was so into freeing it up that he forgot to free it up to something in particular. That was like a pitcher throwing freely toward the south end of the ballpark instead of to the pocket of the catcher's glove. He had, in effect, gone from being too careful to being careless with his putts, from being too tight to too loose. 
In putting, the challenge is to make a free stroke to a specific target. Guiding, steering, or being careful with a putting stroke are faults bred by doubt. Davis and I worked on the same principles for his full swing routine. Again, his problem was that he tended to get a little careless. I asked him to make sure he took time to decide precisely what kind of shot he wanted to hit before he took his practice swing. Then he needed to make that swing serious, as if he were really hitting. When he does those things and looks at a specific target, he's a great striker of the ball. We talked about practice regimens and preparing for tournament play. I'm not a believer in hitting hundreds of practice balls, especially putts, just for the sake of hitting them. I'm much more interested in the quality of a player's practice than the quantity. A player has to know himself. He has to know how much and what kinds of practice he needs to be at his best. A player needs to find the happy medium. This notion appealed to Davis. He has always wanted to be as good as he can be. He dreams of winning major championships, and he is willing to work as hard as necessary to fulfill those dreams. But he wants to be his best as efficiently as possible. Partly because he's had wrist problems, he's not interested in practice for the sake of practice. He has other interests that are also important to him, his family and his hobbies. He loves to hunt and fish. But Davis also thought, erroneously in my opinion, that his father wouldn't have agreed. He remembers the taskmaster in his father, and he hears the whispers that he could be even better if he worked harder. There is tragedy in this. Davis Love Jr. died in a small plane crash in 1988. Davis III felt the pain that any son feels at the loss of a father who loved him and whom he loved. But he also felt very keenly the loss of a mentor. He often wonders about the conversations he and his father would have had. Based on my conversations with Davis Jr., I know several things. One is that he would be thrilled to see how much Davis III has accomplished. He would, I think, say that Davis III is doing great and getting better. He would understand that his son might get tight, anxious, and worse if he started living and breathing golf 24 hours a day. Tightness and anxiety largely account, I think, for the problems that Davis used to have playing well in major championships. After he'd won on the tour half a dozen times, writers started including him in their perennial list of best players never to have won a major. Publicly, Davis always responded, that since he had never contended in a major, it was impossible for anyone to say that he was capable of winning one. He was trying to reduce the pressure on himself to lower everyone's expectations. Going into the 1994 season, playing well in the majors was Davis's top priority. He arrived at Augusta thinking that he was playing well and putting well. But, as often happens, when a player is too tight, he played badly. He missed the cut. It hurt, and Davis went into a tailspin that lasted the rest of the summer. Golf stopped being fun for him. Worse, he stopped doing the things he needs to do to play well. At home, he practiced less. He'd fly to a tournament site on Tuesday, go to the practice range, and start trying to figure out where his swing was and what he needed to do to get ready. His native ability helped him get by. But after finishing second on the money list in 1992, and 12th in 1993, he fell out of the top 30 and failed to win a tournament. At the time, he didn't realize what was happening. He thought he was a victim of some bad breaks, and he was very close to where he had been in 1992 and 93. But he wasn't. Davis started to come out of this funk at the President's Cup in the fall of 1994. Energized by the challenge of team competition, he got focused on his game again and played well. But it was too late to salvage the season. He missed the Tour Championship. He didn't qualify for the Masters. I was only one of several people who told Davis that autumn that his commitment had slipped. So did Jack Lumpkin, Davis's swing teacher. So did Penta, his mother. And for that, Davis deserves some credit. Part of the trick of staying at the top of golf is surrounding yourself with people who are supportive, but who know how to tell you when you're off track. And part of the trick is listening to them. Davis did both. 
Starting in November and December of that year, Davis worked hard. This didn't mean he beat balls all day and wore himself out, but he did the work on his fundamental skills. And he didn't return to the tour until he was confident that he had fixed his swing glitches and was mentally ready to play well. He skipped a few of the early tournaments that he normally plays in Hawaii and Tucson, and he jumped in at Phoenix. It was clear he was much sharper than he had been in 1994. But he no longer had the luxury of working his way back into peak form in relative anonymity. Because of his play in 1994, he had not qualified for a master's invitation. The only way he was going to get one was winning one of the first tournaments of the year. As the tour left California and reached Florida, this became a running sidebar for the golf press. Could Davis do it? The reporters pressed him at every stop. He came close, finishing well at Phoenix, Pebble Beach, and Durrell. The next to the last chance came at the Players' Championship. With the TPC Stadium course set up to be very difficult, he opened with a 73, then shot 67 and was tied for third. On Saturday, he shot a 74 but was still tied for fifth, three strokes back of Corey Pavin and Bernard Longer. With the wind up, the greens dried out, and the rough high, he managed a 72 on Sunday. He was three strokes short of Lee Jansen's winning total. There was just one chance left, the Freeport McMoran Classic at English Turn Golf Club in New Orleans. The challenge of winning the one tournament he had left to qualify for the Masters was an extraordinary one. First of all, no one controls the outcome of a tournament. Second, no one can play his best if something deflects his attention from the process of hitting each shot well. The task Davis faced was like trying to perform brain surgery in the middle of a circus. The Masters was that distracting. Moreover, he had to cope with the conflict between what he thought his father would have advised him to do and what his own experience told him was best. He thought that his father would have been on him to grind hard, to be on the range early Monday morning for a videotape practice session, working on swing flaws, to fly to New Orleans Monday night, not wasting time traveling during the day, to play a practice round Tuesday morning and spend Tuesday afternoon on the practice tee in the putting green, to play in the Pro-Am Wednesday morning and then have another full afternoon of practice. I suspect Davis Jr. would have in fact have had a different attitude. I think he knew that the grinding, practice till your hands bleed attitude is great for a player who's trying to go from average to very good. But it's less effective for a player who's trying to go from very good to excellent. At the top levels of golf, the best players have an element of aristocratic nonchalance. They practice hard until they feel they're playing well. Then they know that it's time to ease off a little bit to relax. When the tournament started, Davis was playing well. He opened with a 68, four off the lead. On Friday, his 69 moved him into a tie for third. And on Saturday, he made two eagles and three birdies and shot 66 to take the lead. As soon as he took the lead, the distractions intensified. People in the crowd were yelling, Master's tickets, I need Master's tickets. In the press room, reporters barraged him with questions. Did he think he could win and make the Masters? We had talked about these kinds of distractions in the past, and Davis knew what to do. Every time someone mentioned the Masters to him, he needed to think, If I want to win this tournament and get in the Masters, I have to concentrate on my routine on every shot. I can't start thinking about the Masters. But it wasn't easy. Mike Heinen made a tremendous run at Davis that Sunday, shooting a 62. Just before he made the turn, Davis looked at a leaderboard and saw that he had fallen two strokes behind. As I've said, I don't recommend that players look at the boards. But a lot of players can't or won't avoid the leaderboards, and Davis is one of them. If that's the case they had better be able to use the leaderboard as a cue to focus tightly on their own games, their own routines. Davis did that. He was standing on the ninth green, waiting to try an eight-foot birdie putt, and he told himself, Okay, let's just play ten holes focused on routine. Just go through the routine and get freer every time. Thinking that way, he knocked in the putt. The chase was on. 
He eagled the 11th, birdied the 13th and 15th, and regained the lead by two strokes. He hooked his drive into a trap at number 16, but managed to reach the green and make his par. On number 18, a watery, sandy par 4 of 471 yards, he aimed his drive at a letter in the Freeport McMoran sign behind the green and blasted the ball more than 300 yards down the fairway, leaving himself no more than 150 yards to the hole. For him, this was a 9-iron. But then he thought, no, I'll hit a smooth 8. Just play it somewhere to the right side of the green. He quit on the shot and pushed it into a bunker, another bogey, and the tournament was tied. Although numbers 17 and 18 are tough finishing holes, a lot of armchair critics were doubtless thinking that Davis had choked, that he was afraid or lacked confidence. Choking, though, is nothing more than being distracted by something. In Davis's case, focusing on the Masters had distracted him from two vital elements of his pre-shot routine. The first was picking out the smallest possible target. When Davis aimed for vague targets like an area of the green on number 17 and a side of the green on number 18, he was setting himself up for trouble. As he told me afterwards, the most dangerous thing you can do is hit a ball without knowing where it is going. The second vital element he forgot was decisiveness. His first instinct told him to hit a 9-iron to the 18th green. 99% of the time a player will do better if he follows that first instinct and hits a decisive shot than he will if he reconsiders and goes to another club. Fortunately, Davis had the self-awareness to figure out his mistake. He had never won a playoff before, but he knew what he had to fix to win this one. He and Haydn each parred number 16, the first playoff hole. They came again to number 17. This time, Davis picked out a tiny target. He'd been drawing his irons that day, so he picked out a leg of the television tower behind the green, about 15 feet right of the hole. He swung, and the shot took off, drawing toward the flag just as he had envisioned it. It nearly went in, but it stopped three feet away. Walking up to that 17th green, Davis's face was red and twitching. Fans could see his lips moving. They could see he was talking to himself. It was a good thing they couldn't hear him, because the language was not pretty. But he got over it in time to tap in the birdie putt and win the tournament. It was, I think, a turning point in his career. The next time we talked, he had two things in a proper perspective. He was pleased and proud that he had reacted to the pressure of the last two bogeys and the playoff, not by getting upset, but by correcting his error and getting back to his mental routine. He certainly should have been. But his satisfaction was unsullied for only an hour or so. The people at Augusta faxed their invitation to English Turn and let him know they were glad he'd be coming back to the Masters. Then, as he was leaving English Turn, someone broke the news that Harvey Pennock had died. The golf world knew what Harvey Pennock meant to Tom Kite and Ben Crenshaw. Not so many knew of his link to Davis. My dad, Davis III would say, basically thought Harvey Pennock was the greatest man who ever lived. He was golf to my dad. So when Harvey died, it was to Davis as if another link to his father went with him. He was no longer in the mood to celebrate. He didn't even want to follow his normal practice routine at Augusta. He wanted to fly to Austin Tuesday night, attend Harvey Pennock's funeral on Wednesday, and fly back to Augusta just in time to hit a few practice balls Wednesday night. Ben Crenshaw talked him out of it. Ben had played with Davis on Thursday and Friday in New Orleans. He missed the cut and went home to Austin, and he was there when Mr. Pennock died. Davis was not convinced, but his wife and his mother both seconded Ben's advice. And of course, there was a side of him that couldn't wait to get to Augusta. It was not just that he could tell that his swing and his putting stroke were grooved. It was the way he had won in New Orleans, recovering his composure and coming back to win the playoff. He had proven something to himself. In a sad, ironic way, his grief over Harvey Pennock's death helped Davis. It eliminated any possibility that he would be euphoric or giddy after New Orleans. I spoke with Davis briefly before each round of the Masters. I tried to remind him to keep thinking the way he had in the New Orleans playoff, to let it go to a precise target, 
to follow his routine on every shot, and to stay patient. Davis was a little shaky in the first round, shooting 37 on the front nine, but it was a mark of his improved confidence that he did not get discouraged or impatient and turn that mediocre start into a round that would eliminate him from contention. He played the back nine in 32 and finished the day tied for ninth. Another 69 on Friday left him tied for seventh. A 71 on Saturday gave him a 209 total, tied for 11th with Greg Norman, but only three shots behind the 54-hole leaders, Crenshaw and Brian Henninger. He came to the course Sunday morning excited. When Davis is excited, he walks faster, he talks faster, he thinks faster. He is ready to go. He knew that he had to find a way to slow himself down a little, to take deep breaths, to amble from place to place instead of striding. So he found a few old friends from home, got the appropriate passes and badges, and sat down with them on the front porch of the Augusta National Clubhouse and had lunch. Davis relaxed a little. When lunch was over, he warmed up with Jack Lumpkin at the practice range and then came over to the putting green where I found him. I was thinking of something I'd recently heard about the UCLA basketball team. In the NCAA championship game, the Bruins had had to play without their great little point guard, Tyus Edney, who was injured. Despite Edney's absence, UCLA played a great game and won. Afterwards, one of the players credited their loose, confident attitude to something Ed O'Bannon had said to his teammates in a huddle early in the game. Forget that it's the NCAA championships, O'Bannon had said. It's only a pickup game. Play street ball. So as Davis left the putting green and headed for the first tee, that was what I told him. Remember, it's just a pickup game. Davis and Norman paired together, both parred number one and birdied number two, a reachable par five. Davis birdied number five and Norman birdied number six, sinking a putt from off the green. Number seven became a key hole for Davis after he hit a bad drive into the trees on the right side of the hole. Number seven is a short par four, only 360 yards, but the green and its surrounding bunkers and swales are treacherous. Davis had only 130 yards left, but no direct shot to the green. He had to hit a low fade under and around the trees, then over a deep bunker that fronts the green. He cut a seven iron into the green and saved his par. Then he birdied number eight, the second par five, and parred number nine. He turned in 33. He and Norman were momentarily tied for the lead. No cliché in golf is truer than the maxim that the Masters begins on the back nine Sunday afternoon. Starting with Amen Corner, the course provides nine opportunities for drama, heroism, and disaster. The winner is usually the player who handles his game and his emotions best under this intense pressure. All right, Davis told himself, you've got a challenge ahead of you. You've got a long way to go. Let's play the best nine holes you've ever played. Get into the routine. Have some fun. Routine saved him. Though he was transparently nervous and excited, he felt a kind of peace as he settled into the familiar chain of actions, reading the green, selecting the target and the line, aligning his body, taking one last look and letting it go. Click, click, click. The ball rolled in. He parred 11 and 12, not easy holes to par in those circumstances. But number 13, the 485-yard par 5, that is wrapped around Ray's Creek, has always been a difficult hole for Davis. His long tee shot always makes it possible to reach the green in two and make a birdie. But the second shot must always be hit from an uphill lie, which makes it impossible to hit his bread-and-butter approach shot a high fade. He thought of the times he'd misplayed that shot, and he misplayed it again, hitting a seven iron to the left of the green, way too far left, seemingly miles from the hole. He three-putted for a par that felt like a bogey. Norman birdied the hole, and now Davis was behind both him and Crenshaw. He was, he would recall later, nervous, very nervous. But over the last five holes, he forgot his mistake on number 13. He learned how well he could play nervous. At number 14, he hit a wedge approach to two feet and made birdie. His drive on the 500-yard par 15th was so long 
that he needed only a nine iron for his second shot. It stopped ten feet from the pin, and he almost holed the eagle putt. At number sixteen, he hit a six iron almost exactly where he wanted it. It flew over the water and landed on the green, a hundred ninety yards away. The ball needed to be about two feet further left. If it had been, it would have caught a slope and rolled down toward the pin, probably stopping within five feet. Instead, it hung on the upper terrace of the green, 60 feet away. Davis made a good run at the putt, but it was impossible to stop it close to the hole. He bogeyed it. He told himself that he was not out of it if he could birdie the last two holes. Number 17 is a 400-yard par 4. For professionals, the drive past the Eisenhower tree is not a problem. The approach shot is. Unless it's struck precisely, the ball can roll off to the left or right of the hole, leaving treacherous chips and making bogey a distinct possibility. Standing in the fairway after another long, straight drive, Davis thought briefly of some of the disastrous shots he had seen there. Then he reminded himself of all that he had learned that spring of the discipline he had acquired. He said to himself, let's hold this shot and focus tightly on the pin. He swung his wedge. The ball stopped six inches from the hole. He made the putt. And of course, he didn't win. He played the 18th bravely, getting up and down from the left side of the green for his par. He shot 66, and his total of 275 would have won 16 of the previous 18 masters. But Crenshaw, Playing behind him was just as brave and a little better with the putter. He won by a shot. But Davis didn't lose. He had not only played his way into contention in a major championship for the first time in his career, he had played well down the stretch. He can only get better. My last story is about how Tom Kite honors his commitment. Once in a while, someone will approach me at a golf tournament or a clinic and tell me what a relief it is to learn that he can become a first-class golfer just by changing the way he thinks. Or someone out on the tour will come to me because he's heard that I help players get better just by changing the way they think. I am at once flattered, embarrassed, and slightly irritated by this kind of compliment. It's true that a lot of golfers who are presently averaging 95 could drop that average under 90 by improving their thinking, staying in the present, trusting their swings, picking out small targets, accepting the results of their shots, following intelligent routines and game plans. There are weekend players who don't want to practice, and it will be content to break 85 or 80 on occasion. I'm happy to be able to help them develop that kind of game to its fullest by thinking effectively. But there are others who have reached that stage and are tired of it. They want to press ahead, to test themselves. They want to play well consistently. Some of them, unfortunately, would like to believe that all this requires is a psychological massage, a quick and easy change in their thinking. This bothers me both because it's inaccurate and because it undervalues the work done by players who do improve. I wish that I could take all of the fantasizers with me someday to watch Tom Kite practice. Then they might begin to understand the commitment required to find out how good they can be. A typical day at home in Austin during the golf season begins with Tom rising early and seeing his children off to school. Then he goes to the course. He stretches carefully and thoroughly. He'll hit wedges and work his way up through his irons in his woods. Then he'll work on his short game some more. This might take two or three hours. He's not counting. Nor is he paying much attention to the weather. If it's a sunny day in July, it might be 98 degrees out in the practice tee. He will stay out there until sweat plasters a shirt to his back and the trousers to his thighs. Take a short break to towel off and drink some water and then practice some more. Then, Tom might play a round, but he'll play it competitively, 
trying to simulate tournament conditions as closely as possible. After the round, he'll go back to the practice tee and work on whatever facets of his game that did not meet his standards when he played. Up until this point, I could be describing the practice regiments of any number of first-rate players. What separates Tom from the rest is the quality of his practice, not just the quantity. Some players just beat balls. They work, but they don't improve. Tom does not practice out of fear of failure. He hates to lose, and he loves to win, but he's not afraid of failing. His love of winning drives his practice habits. He doesn't see practice as an exercise in self-denial or sacrifice. He sees it as an integral part of the process of improvement and winning. He sees himself as a winner. He knows that the competition is working hard. Some are getting better. He will do whatever is necessary to be as prepared as he can be, because that is how he maximizes his chances of winning. As he practices, Tom is constantly challenging his mind and his creativity in an effort to do both. Tom finds ways to inject fun and tension into short game practice. He'll seek out a thin, sandy patch of worn-out grass, drop some balls, and hit lob wedges to a high pin. From such a lie, his misses look awful, plopping weakly into the bunker or flying low over the green like frightened quail. But he knows that when he can handle this drill, he is hitting the ball precisely. Sometimes it amazes me just how precisely. When he practices putts, I ask him to tell me which side of the hole the ball will enter and how fast. He does. I have seen him stand 8 to 10 feet from the hole on a flat section of the practice green and chip in 8 consecutive balls with a sand wedge without scuffing the grain. Most of all, Tom's commitment is such that he treats setbacks as goads to get better. If he could play one shot from his career over again, it probably would be the ball he hit into the swollen waters of the creek on the fifth hole at Rochester's Oak Hill Country Club during the last round of the 1989 U.S. Open. Going into that day, he had recorded masterful rounds of 67, 69, and 69. He led by a stroke over Scott Simpson and three over Curtis Strange. Mentally, he felt as sharp as he ever had. The fatal shot at number five was a block to the right. After the penalty, Tom reached the green of the par four in four, and upset three putted from 12 feet. The open slipped away. As soon as the tournament was over, Tom reflected honestly on his mental state at the time he hit the ball. Mentally, he had done everything he was supposed to do. There was only one other conclusion to reach. His swing had broken down. Tom looked at film and talked with two teaching professionals he trusted, Chuck Cook and John Rhodes. He decided that under pressure, his swing was prone to deliver the club into the ball on an inside-to-out path that was too pronounced. This sometimes happened on the range, too, but you tend to forget those. It was the same problem that plagued Greg Norman and Johnny Miller at certain stages of their careers. Tom and his teachers agreed to make a significant swing change, widening his stance and flattening his swing plane so that he could square the club face with his body rather than his arms. A lot of players of Tom's stature would be leery of making this kind of change, knowing that their games might regress for a while. But Tom did not want the thought of possible block shots hanging over him. He was still on a quest to see how good he could be, and if that quest required a swing change, so be it. He started working on the change during the off-season at the end of 1989. He spent countless hours on practice tees. As Tom says, he doesn't keep time when he's having fun. For him, improvement is fun. He enjoys nothing more than the feeling of getting better. Finally, early in the 1992 season, it all fell into place. Golf started to seem easy. If he wanted to hit it high, he hit it high. If he wanted to turn it right to left, he turned it. His wedges were sharp. He putted confidently. He won the Bell South Classic in Atlanta, his first title in 16 months. Heading into the early summer in the U.S. Open at Pebble Beach, he felt like a pilot who has broken through the clouds to find smooth air and a tailwind. Everything was copacetic. Pebble Beach is one of Tom's favorite courses. He'd won the Bing Crosby there. He holds the course record. 
Pebble Beach embodies the kind of challenge and tradition he respects most in golf. But for some reason, at Pebble Beach, Tom found that his swing had gone slightly awry. A lot of people who had spent the time and effort Tom did to modify their swings would have reacted by spending the whole week trying to find that tight, beautiful little draw again. Worse, they might have persuaded themselves that there was no way they could play well without it. Tom, fortunately, knew better. A rundown of Tom's final round shows how this was possible. Tom arrived at the course Sunday morning, one stroke behind the leader, Gil Morgan. The practice tee at Pebble Beach is inland a bit from the ocean and protected from the brunt of the wind, so Tom did not immediately realize what the conditions would be like that day. He warmed up with his lawn clubs, then made sure to spend some time practicing flop shots at the chipping and pitching green the USGA had installed for the Open. Then he went to the putting green. There, he felt the wind start to freshen and blow hard off the Pacific, up to 30 miles an hour. He saw the sun shining, and he realized that the combination of sun and wind would dry the greens until he had the resilience of billiard tables. It would be a brutal day for scoring. The wind would affect every shot. Some greens would be nearly impossible to hold, and a lot of pins would be inaccessible. Trying to gauge the wind at number five, a par three, he came off his five iron a bit and hit the ball into a right-hand bunker. When he reached it, he saw that the ball was buried in the sand. Oh, man, he said to himself. I've just made a double bogey from the bunker at number four, and now I've got another bunker shot. But he dragged his mind away from number four and back into the present, hit a great explosion, and stopped the ball eight feet from the hole. Then he hit his par-saving putt into the heart of the hole. There isn't much room for spectators at the fifth hole, and television rarely covers it. So when people talk about Tom's round at Pebble Beach, they rarely mention this hole. But the two short shots he hit to save his par at number five were as important as any he struck that day. The tiny 113-yard seventh presented a harrowing shot. It's the tip of a promontory with an elevated tee. The wind was howling off the ocean. The only way to hit the green would have been to hit the ball out over the water and trust the wind to bring it back. The approximate aim point would almost have to be Yokohama. One player among the last 30 that day pulled the shot off. Tom hit another six iron on a hole that is generally no more than a sandwich shot, trying to keep it low under the wind. But from the elevated tee, that was impossible. He watched the wind catch the ball and drive it left, left of the bunker, into thick rough by the eighth tee. He faced his next shot calmly. The wind, directly in his face now, would help him this time, holding the shot and helping it land softly. He had been practicing his flop shot all week just for a moment like this. He swung confidently and lofted the ball over the bunker. It landed on the green, rolled directly to the hole, and fell in. At number eight, the classic par four that spans the Pacific Inlet, he faced a club selection problem. Normally, he hit a three-wood to the landing area about 265 yards out in the fairway, but the gale behind him suggested that a three-wood might be too much. So might a four-wood, which would get up in the wind. A three-iron seemed right. Then an even harder gust blew in from the ocean. Mike, Tom said to Mike Carrick, his caddy, do you think four-iron would be enough? Maybe it is, Mike said. It was. Tom blew the four iron 260 yards up the fairway into perfect position. Then he hit a beautiful eight iron over the cliffs and brine and into the green. It landed just short of the pin and caromed as high as the flag. He wound up in the rough behind the green. It left him much the same little flop shot he'd had at number seven, and he hit it almost as well. He made a four foot putt for his par. At number 10, which winds its way further along the cliff, he pulled his drive left, conscious of the close brush with disaster he had survived on number 9. His lie was terrible, and he could only hack a 7-iron out into the fairway. But he hacked it to the perfect yardage for his lob wedge, 68 yards. He knocked the pitch stiff and made par. At number 12, a par 3, with the wind blowing fiercely from left to right, he took a four-iron, 
closed the face a little, and tried to hit a big hook. The ball started out at the left edge of the green. On a calm day, it might have hooked 20 yards left. But the wind blew it 20 yards right, onto the green, about 30 feet right of the hole. The crowd around the green exploded with applause, as if he had knocked it right up against the pin. Tom had always liked the green at number 12. Over the years in various tournaments, he'd made a number of birdies on it. With those thoughts in mind, he stroked his putt and hold it. The crowd, of course, erupted again. He walked to the 13th tee feeling, as he said later, super good about everything. The birdie at number 14 gave him a substantial lead. He was at five under par. He felt in control. He'd gotten past the worst holes on the golf course. At number 15, he hit a good tee shot with his three wood, but he hooked it a little too much trying to hold it against the wind. It landed in the left rough. He knocked a great iron shot to the edge of the green, stroked a 40-foot putt to within inches, and made his par. The crowd was roaring. And for a few seconds, Tom was tempted to celebrate with them. But he reminded himself that he had three tough holes left to play, gave them a smile and a tip of his hat, and tried to focus on business. All week long, Tom had been hitting three woods off the tee at number 18, the famous par 5 that stretches 548 yards along the ocean's edge. But his last three shots with that club had failed to find short grass. He wanted a club he could hit confidently. What do you think about driver, he asked Mike. Mike, probably trying to avoid looking at the ocean, gulped and said, yeah, that's fine. Tom fell back on the pre-shot habits he had practiced for so many years. He picked out his target. He confined himself to one swing thought, slow. He took the club back as slowly as he could. On tape later, he would see that there was nothing particularly slow about the swing, but he felt like a figure in a slow-motion movie. He swung. That's a tea picker upper Mike said. It was. It was a kind of drive that's hit so well that the golfer doesn't have to watch and see what happens to it. He can bend over pick up the tee, and start walking. It was straight, and it was long. He could have, if he had had a big lead, or was a stroke behind, gone for the green in two. He laid up with a five iron, leaving himself once again with 70 yards left to the hole, the perfect distance for his lob wedge. When he knocked his third onto the green, he knew that his long quest for a major championship was over. His triumph demonstrated so many things. It showed the importance of the short game. It showed the importance of staying in the present. It showed the importance of commitment, commitment to improvement, commitment to doing whatever you can do to win.